Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Yiltan, and I go to Queen's University in Kingston, and I'm presenting benchmarking MPI for deep learning and HPC workloads. So structure of this presentation, uh, introduction, and then I'm going to first discuss some deep learning benchmarking, because that's what I did my master's in. And then the second section will be on partition communication, which is what I'm currently working on. And then I'll conclude that and discuss where I am going in my PhD with that. Okay. So we all know HPC is used for many large problems, and com communication is a common one. Um, MPI is used to program these large systems, and it has multiple APIs, so point-to-point, -point, so between two processes, partition point-to-point, -point, which is um, same as that, but you've partitioned bus for into multiple chunks, RMA, which is one process active and collective, so you communicate uh, with a group of processes. And we've seen a lot of MPI-based deep learning using MPI because it allows you to scale your deep learning applications to thousands of GPUs. So high-level software overview, um, UCX, that is the lowest layer of um, our communication library, and it provides um, primitives to transfer data between GPU memory, CPU memory, network memory, and so forth. And then next layer up is OpenMPI. That is one MPI implementation. And I chose it because it is very commonly used. And collectives are built on top of UCX point to points. Oops. And my main research goals for my master's was to improve GPU communication for deep learning. And now I'm looking into how can we use the MPI partitioned interface and what can we do with it? So benchmarking for MPI-based deep learning. So one of the most common methods is using Horowood. And it can use models from TensorFlow, PyTorch uh, to scale it to thousands of processes. And it commonly uses the data parallel training method using MPI or Reduce, where um, you have one process per GPU, and on each GPU we have a model, and it uses MPI or Reduce to average uh, various parameters. And we profiled on the right hand side, and anywhere from 17 to 83% of our application uh, was spent in MPI or Reduce. And for certain models, up to 80% was spent um, in MPI or reduced with GPU buffers. So we proposed a multipath copy, which was developed into a collective. Um, so traditionally, MPI sends data directly between GPUs um, because that is the most direct and simple path. Um, but we noticed there's IMV links that go through the host that um, are idle. So there was a large amount of unused potential bandwidth. So we asked ourselves, can we design a mechanism to use all of the NV links uh, in parallel uh, to increase bandwidth utilization? So we first used the UCX perf test, and this is comes with UCX, and it's usually used to just validate your system is performing how you would expect it. But we use it as a tool to design our uh, modifications to the UCX library. So on this right-hand side, we see the blue line, which is directly between GPUs. And with the colored ones, uh, we see that um, what, we would, what additional bandwidth we would gain by using the host um, channel. And we can see with different stream counts, uh, we get different uh, peak bandwidths. And this optimal stream count is based on the message size itself. Uh, and there was up to 53 gigabytes a second of additional bandwidth that we were able to gain. So the idea is now we use the blue line and we combine it with some of the other lines to get additional performance. So we designed a MPI or reduce algorithm using that mechanism. Uh, so this is a quick summary. So we use a intrasocket reduce. We exchange the data between GPUs and then an intrasocket broadcast to redistribute the data. Um, so to optimize this, we pipeline steps one and three, um, because you could see that not at all times that every link was used. And we dynamically switch between PCIe and NVLink, and we dynamically switch between using our mechanism and the direct method, because in certain scenarios, using the direct method would actually be better. So we used uh, the Synet MIST system at the University of Toronto. And for those of you who have worked with supercomputers, this is similar to Surex, uh, Summit and Sierra, but I only have access to four nodes at a time, so much smaller. Um, so first we test with UCX put because that is the lowest layer of our software stack. And we're able to get 1.67 speed up. 
Um, and once we had used our UCX test, then we moved on to MPI, um, as that is the next layer up. So we used Ohio State microbenchmarks, and we were able to get 1.84x speed up. Um, so as we move up the stack, we validate our design. And then, then we moved on to a collective, uh, MPI or reduce, um, and we got much lower latency than HPCX and uh, some speed up over Ember Pitch GDR and Nickel. Um, so in this figure, lower is better, and the pink bra is what we did. Um, and then we tested it with ResNet 50 using the Horowood synthetic benchmarks, and we got 1.56x speed up. And we played around with the Horowood fusion threshold, which modifies the aggregation of uh, data before you call it NPR or reduce call. And we found that adjusting it did get some additional improvement. So now for the second part, benchmarking MPI partition communication. So this is what I am working on in my PhD. So this, this um, is fairly new to MPI. It was added in 4.0, so around June 2021. So let's say you have two processes. You have your MPI send init and P receive init, which initializes communication. So you do your message matching. But one uh, thing you can't do with MPI partitions is use wildcards. So you can't do MPI tag receive any from any process. And then once you're ready, you call MPI start to start your communication. And then a parallel loop is launched. So in this work, we stuck to OpenMP um, because some of the CUDA support for MPI partitioned isn't quite there yet or, and it's not standardized. So your thread, computes, and then once the thread is ready to send its data, it calls pready. It doesn't necessarily send the data, it just notifies the library that when you're ready, send it. And then on the receiver side, we can call MPI arrive to check if the message has arrived. And then we call MPI wait all to finish our round of communication. And as MPI persistent is, MPI partition is persistent, we can loop over this parallel region and call these pReadies multiple times. So a good implementation doesn't have the serialization issues of uh, MPI point-to-point -point with MPI thread multiple. And that was the motivation between this new programming model um, in addition to traditional MPI send receive. So what we noticed is that uh, traditional benchmarks, so Sandia microbenchmark, OSU, and Intel, uh, they didn't have any support for MPI partitioned. That's expected as this is a fairly new addition to the standard. Um, so we wanted to see what could, how could we measure it. And we couldn't use traditional benchmarking techniques like latency and bandwidth because um, the goal of MPI partitioned is instead of having your compute and then the burst on the network and then more compute is to have that network usage spread across time as opposed to um, in distinct bursts. And then there's no production applications because of its fairly newness. So we want to see um, how can we, which applications can we port and which ones should we focus on? So we wanted to uh, ask the following questions. How can we understand the behavior of MPI partitioned? Uh, what applications we want to work on? And what is the appropriate partition size? So how many chunks do you want to split your data in? And what granul granularity of work do you want? So we use the Niagara supercomputer at Sinet, so University of Toronto again, but this is their CPU cluster. So the first question is, what is the a cost of using MPI partitioned? So what we do here, we essentially calculate the, uh, the ratio between using MPI partitioned to traditional send receive uh, to see how much more expensive is it than using that model. And this is just wire efficiency. It's not really um, giving you the overhead an application would face because this is assuming we're comparing them both being bursty on the network. So we notice that partition count correlates with overhead and it mostly impacts small messages. So if you're using small messages, you probably shouldn't use MPI partition for that scenario because you can see here, we see a 60 times overhead for a 1K message when you split it up into 32 chunks, because now you're sending 32, 32 byte messages, and then you have the processing overheads and the header overheads and many more things. So perceived bandwidth. So this is a similar to a traditional bandwidth metrics. So the message size over the time, but here we're just messaging 
measuring the last message. So what our goal here is if we were to compare a network that uh, with the bursts to a network that, I'm going to phrase that correctly. Uh, if we're trying to compare partitioned, how what type of network we would need for a traditional point-to-point -point application to work the same way, what amount of bandwidth would we require? So with 0% noise, um, we see more or less the traditional bandwidth curve. There is some noise from how we measured it. So what we can see from here, if your application is very well balanced between processes and threads, stick to MPI point-to-point. And then we notice when we add noise, we get this peak bandwidth here. And depending on the noise, adjusts where that peak is. And it's always in that middle message range where we see the most benefit of using MPI partitioned. And after we see that peak, we see a drop simply because now the network is our actual uh, limitation. So moving to MPI partitioned probably wouldn't benefit. So if you're using very large messages, then probably point to point would be better than moving towards this model. So those are point to point benchmarks. So we wanted to see if we have multiple processes, how could what could we what could we see? So we looked at a sweeping uh, communication pattern, and it has lots of dependencies. And um, we saw that we have high throughputs with um, uh, multi threading compared to single threaded. And for the smaller messages, it performs more or less the same as uh, MPI thread multiple, but for larger messages, we see a slight difference between the two. So we see up to 15x speed up, uh, not speed up, high throughputs for our large messages. So potential application improvements. Uh, so we found the SNAP uh, code, which is a proxy application for partisan and it uses a sweep three uh, 3D communication pattern. So we profiled it and then speculated on what we could hope to see in that speed up from that. So one thing you'll notice strange in this figure is that we steadily increase and then we go up, but we're only up to 256 processes. Um, we didn't actually have access to go to a larger scale where actual large applications would work at, but we'd expect it to continue to a certain point then plateau. Um, so concluding this work, um, benchmarking for deep learning. Uh, deep learning commonly uses MPL reduce with large messages. So improving uh, that part of the MPL library can be beneficial for those types of applications. And we proposed the collective and we saw some good speed up. So GPU messages in MPL reduce is quite important. And then for part, uh, MPI partition communication, we provided the first micro benchmark suite. So we hope that other um, industry standard benchmarks can take some of the techniques that we have used. Um, as this was a quick summary, I only showed two of the metrics we actually analyzed. We analyzed noise distributions and so other things like that. Um, and we showed what communications could benefit. Uh, so sweeping, sweeping communication patterns is what we saw as promising. We did look at halo exchange, but not as much speed up from those. Um, and for our future work, um, we want to compare across the different MPI implementations. So we are comparing an MPI implementation to itself. We want to see, does MPitch perform better than open MPI for very specific applications and uh, metrics? And then we all, I want to actually port the applications to use MPI partitioned because I have speculated, but I want to see um, that being put into practice. And partition collectives is the natural extension of point to point, and hopefully by MPI 5.0, they will be standardized. Um, so that is where I would like to go with this work during my PhD. So thank you. Uh, I was supported by Synet and CERC and the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. And these are the works that I am referencing. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations for staying well within your time. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Uh, I had never heard of the MPI partition stuff. Uh, if you could entertain me for maybe a minute and tell me why was it included in MPI standard? What, what, what was their motivation? Are you using it in that way? Or is what you use a side effect? And then how many MPI libraries are supporting this? Because comparing 
MPitch to Open MPI or Intel MPI requires support for it, I assume. So MPI partitioned is fairly new. So maybe like a year old, it was added to the standard and it was added by, um, it was pushed by employees at Sandia at the time um, because we have seen systems have more and more cores these days. And MPI doesn't scale the best when you have 30 processes on a single uh, CPU. With, there seems to be much better efficiency of having one or two processes and then you scale with cores because uh, there are some memory limitations to having one MPI process per core. So it helps with some of those scaling issues. And then as, as for what MPI implementations exist, OpenMPI has it, MPitch has it, but right now their implementations are fairly simple just to be compliant to the specification rather than this is the optimal performance. Right now we've noticed they don't perform any worse than point to point. So there isn't like a negative to it, but at this, at this current moment, as they're still working it, there isn't like a huge advantage yet um, to move to that. Uh, does that answer your questions? I haven't actually checked the commercials because I don't work with it, but I would assume that would be correct. We don't make oh, okay. ah. electric shocks. <laughs> no worries. Um, does it make sense to use that to speed up uh, traditional HPC and um, more um, like HPC networks when you can utilize multiple uh, network links, network paths simultaneously? Do you think there's benefit for that, or you think the the, the overhead would? I mean, like typically, you you would probably use it for like big data um, communication, like like gigabyte or meg megabytes of data. So in HPC, it's like typical that the message sizes are not that big. But if you couldn't do packing and then use multiple links or multiple paths in the network, it would probably benefit. So I don't know if 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 there's a way to combine those two aspects, like um, packing of messages into bigger chunks, um, communication, computation over uh, overlapping, and then doing the partitioning to c communicate across multiple paths to speed up everything. So yeah, so as you saw with the overheads, having more and more partitions doesn't necessarily get better performance because there is some downside to it. But in the MPI standard, it does say imp implementers should think about aggregation, aggregation of those messages. So I haven't discussed it because I haven't published the work yet, but that is some of those ideas of how do we better use the network resources so a user may request a thousand partitions, but we don't want to send a thousand discrete messages over the network. Um, so yeah, so we are do doing that work and it's alluded to in the standard that that's a part to take. Yep. 